Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our program. My name is George Jarakis. I'm a partner at Vincent and Elkins in our tax practice group. Um, our goal is for this to be relatively informal discussion. So this is kind of an interesting mashup of two topics. Some of you may be really interested in the new corporate all minim alternative minimum tax, and some of you may be interested in privilege. And I'm, what I'm going to try to do is use um, the, the new corporate alternative minimum tax as a case study for how privilege um, uh, applies in tax planning matters. So just to level set, um, the corporate all minimum AMT is, is new. And it applies for tax years that begin after January 1, 2023. The headline rate is 15%. There's no, um, I think there's there's no coincidence there. Uh, the Obama administration had been working with other members of uh, developed countries around the world to sort of trying to get a uniform 15% rate. I think that's where the 15% rate came from. Um, the base, and this is what's really significant about this new tax the, the 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 base is applicable financial statement income book you know book income not not the income you put on your tax return but uh, the income you put on your applicable financial statement under gap or or ifrs or whatever um, you'll have a tentative uh amt at the 15 percent rate if you if you get a foreign tax credit uh, for AMT purposes, you'll, you'll get some reduction there. Um, and the tax kicks in only if it is greater than the sum of two numbers, your regular federal income tax plus the uh, base erosion and anti-abuse tax, the, the beat tax. And, the goal, and it applies only to applicable corporations, um, which means no partnerships, no real estate investment trusts. Uh, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about what an applicable corporation is. Generally speaking, these are uh, corporations that have had um, very substantial book income over a three-year testing period. I think what's going on here is that the, um, the, the government wanted to tax um, some high-profile multinationals who, because they take advantage of perfectly legitimate um, deductions, um, weren't paying a lot of federal income tax, and, the, and just sort of as a political uh, sop, they wanted to say, well, you know, no company that's got book income of more than a billion dollars is going to get away without paying any federal income tax. Um, sounds great in theory, but in practice, it's just um, extremely complicated. I think they originally thought that there were only going to be about a 150 uh, corporations that are subject to this tax. I think uh, our view is that there are potentially a lot more than that. Um, we're going to focus on domestic corporations. There are some rules for corporations that have foreign parents uh, and have U.S. Op um, operations. But one thing that's really important in applying this applicable uh, federal uh, financial statement income test is that um, you average it on a pre-net operating loss basis for the for the three years, uh, including the current uh, preceding the current year. And if it's more than a billion dollars, you're an AF, uh, you're an applicable corporation. Okay, um, lots of questions under the statute. There are not any regulations yet, even though Treasury has a very broad regulatory authority, and they are working on regulations now. Um, the IRS and Treasury did put out a notice uh, right after Christmas, along with a bunch of other guidance, uh, notice 2023-7. Um, and it answers some questions. But despite, despite the notice, which is you know, fairly, fairly substantial, there are many, many open questions, in, including a lot of questions that go to the, to the most threshold question of, are you an applicable corporation? Do you, do you meet this uh, billion dollar AFSI test if you're a domestic corporation? Um, so there, there, there are rules in there that um, tell you some things about how the test applies to consolidated groups and when and how to aggregate various partnerships that a corporation may own um, and other entities. 
but it doesn't answer all questions. Um, there are some rules about how to treat corporations that have experienced changes in ownership, both, both uh, tax-free changes and taxable changes, uh, as well as corporations that have disposed of um, subsidiaries, for example, in spin-offs uh, spin or split-offs or taxable within a three-year period. Again, still leaves a lot of open issues. Um, there's some guidance about how to treat taxpayers emerging from bankruptcy. Uh, there, there are some uh, guidance about how do you deal with the new Inflation Reduction Act um, uh, benefits that you can get and how does that go into computing AFSI. Um, some questions about um, changes in financial accounting. So there's all kinds of guidance, but there are a lot of open questions. And in fact, all you have to look at is, is uh, section nine of the notice, um, and there, are, I think I counted 40 specific requests for comment on some really significant uh, issues in there. So the punchline here is, yes, we have some guidance, but there's a lot of scope for, for interpretation. So um, if you're a corporation and you're trying to figure out how does this apply to me? Um, what do you do? And, and it's, a, it's a very significant question because once you are an applicable corporation, so if, if you meet that test for a particular year, you're, you are an applicable corporation subject to this minimum tax for all later years unless uh, you meet an exception. And right now, we don't have a lot of details on, on the exception. Um, that's one of the things they want comment for, and it may, and it may not be an automatic out. You may actually have to go ask permission to no longer be an applicable corporation once you're in. So it's really, really important, I think, particularly here in 2023, to determine are you, are you subject to this tax. Um, so you're going to have to do right. You're going to have to sit down and do some modeling, um, and when you do that modeling, the financial modeling. Um, you're going to have to make some judgment calls about how to interpret the statute because of, of the lack of guidance. Uh, you, even when you even when you look at the notice 2023-7 guidance, it um, it's not unambiguous. You're going to have to um, make some some decisions about uh, how that how that applies. And so, because many of these are issues of law, or you know, statutory interpretation or application of law to your facts, um, CAMT planning is a useful case study for thinking about, okay, well, um, there are some privileges out there uh, in th that, that we're used to in tax planning. How might they apply to CAMT planning? All right, so just a uh, quick primer on, on privileged communications in the tax context. You can have privilege created at different times sort of in the cycle of, um, of your work. You can do it at the planning stage, uh, whether on transactions or deciding what positions you want to take on your return. Um, you can have uh, privilege when you're, when you're in a dispute, whether it's a, a, an audit from the IRS or actual um, litigation in court. Um, and, and so, Various times you can you can have privileged communications. There are three basic privileges that we deal with on a regular basis: the attorney-client privilege, which is a common law privilege, so it's not in a in a statute. There's the federally authorized tax practitioner privilege, which is in Section 7525 of the Internal Revenue Code, and then there's the attorney work product doctrine, which is also a common law. Um, common law doctrine. And the key to all these privileges is you're trying to maintain confidentiality of some communication. You're trying to keep something secret. Uh, it could be oral, it could be a document, uh, it could be an email, um, it could be an opinion. Okay, so let's start with the attorney-client privilege. So the attorney-client privilege protects communications that are between an attorney and a client uh, that are intended to be confidential, that's a key point here, for the purpose of obtaining legal advice. So it could be the client saying something to the lawyer, or it could be the lawyer's advice um, back to the client. 
you can, you can as, a, as a company, you can waive the attorney-client privilege uh, if you disclose a privileged communication to a third party. If you think about it, if, if I give you some secret advice, uh, if you want that to be privileged, the key is that has to be intended to be confidential. Well, the minute you share that secret advice with somebody who's not a client, that tells the world that you really didn't intend it to be confidential and therefore the privilege can be waived. The key thing about waiver with the attorney-client privilege is when you waive the privilege on one communication, you literally waive the privilege on every other communication related to the same subject matter. So for example, you may have 10,000 documents on a super secret uh, tax position that you've taken, and you may provide one privileged document out of, out of all of those to uh, a third party. You have just waived privilege with respect to all of those documents, okay? You may be investigated by the SEC and you may give one privileged document to the SEC on purpose saying, but we, but we don't really wanna waive uh, the privilege with respect to the, old, the, the rest of the world. You have waived the privilege of the whole subject matter with respect to the rest of the world when you do that. So um, attorney-client privilege is very powerful, but it can be waived. Uh, it applies in civil audits, criminal. It's um, very broad. It applies um, if it's a tax opinion um, or it's tax, tax law advice. It applies even if you're in a, a securities litigation or a contract litigation or employment litigation. Um, now, um, there's a, there are some questions about when is attorney-client privileged advice really legally privileged advice as opposed to, quote, mere tax return preparation. Um, you know, can you, can you have a lawyer, you know, compute your, um, the amount of your basis uh, to put on a tax return where there's no legal judgment involved and claim that's privileged? Probably not. Um, and in fact, there's an interesting case in the U.S. Supreme Court right now covering those types of dual communications. They had oral argument earlier this week, and um, I think we're gonna get some interesting guidance out of the Supreme Court unless they decide they wish they hadn't taken the case. Which, but um, in any event, attorney client privilege is very powerful. Okay, I mentioned the 7525 privilege um, in the Internal Revenue Code. So this provides uh, similar similar protection to communications between a taxpayer and a federally authorized tax practitioner. That could be um, a, a CPA, that could be a tax lawyer in an accounting firm. Um, there, there's some, there's actually a definition of what federally authorized tax practitioner is. The key thing is it's, it follows the attorney client privilege, but it has a couple of very substantial limitations. It, apl it applies only in tax proceedings. So if you have contract litigation or if you have um, litigation with the SEC, it doesn't apply there. It's not privileged there. Um, if it's criminal, if it's a criminal matter, it doesn't apply there. And if the, if the matter on which tax advice was given is a quote, tax shelter, it doesn't apply. And the IRS has been very aggressive in arguing what is a tax shelter. Um, in fact, uh, in a transfer pricing case uh, involving Microsoft, where, where there was a research and development cost sharing agreement, they, they persuaded the district judge that Microsoft's R&D cost sharing um, w arrangement was a tax shelter. And uh, the court held that the communications that were otherwise privileged under 7525 wouldn't be because of, because of the tax shelter uh, exception. Um, so the waiver risk is pretty high with the 7525 privilege because again, it only applies in tax proceedings. So you can protect it if the IRS um, asks for a 7525 communication in an IRS audit, but if the SEC asks for it in an SEC investigation, it's not privileged um, by virtue of the exceptions to 7525. Same with a dispute with an employee. Um, you know, you fire somebody and they sue you for wrongful termination and they were in the tax department. Um, 
7525 doesn't help you there. It's, it's non-privileged. It also does not give you work product protection in litigation. Um, so here's a little Venn diagram that might be useful for you um, to consult later on to sort of remember these rules. The big circle is what the attorney-client privilege covers, and then the small circle in red is what the 7525 tax practitioner privilege covers. Better than nothing, but, but you can't really uh, rely on it completely. Okay, lastly, there's the attorney work product doctrine. Um, this is very different from the attorney client privilege or the 7525 privilege. The key here is that this protects the mental impressions and processes and litigation strategy of your um, attorney or your attorney team in preparing for litigation as well as work product of anybody who helps the attorney in litigation. It could be an expert, could be another agent of the attorney. And, and the reason to, um, to keep this information confidential is really just a fairness one. It's in the adversary process, you don't want to give your adversary, tell your adversary your strategy before, um, you know, while you're still formulating it. Uh, and it applies on both sides, right? The government has it as well. Um, now, you can waive the attorney work product protection, just like you can waive these other privileges. Um, the most common way of waiving something is where you actually put your work product at issue in litigation. You, you, try, to, um, you, you try to disclose, you, you disclose your work product because it benefits you, let's say, in a particular situation. You use it as a so-called sword, but it would not be fair to allow you to do that and then at the same time use it as a shield and say, no, you can't have my work product, but the rest of my work product. So if you put your work product at issue in the litigation, you can uh, waive it. You can also waive it, the protection, if you disclose your work product to it to some third parties. But the, the third party you disclose it to has to be an adversary in order for you to waive the privilege. So for example, um, Let's take a common situation we, we face with our corporate clients. Um, you do a transaction, you have um, a, um, an opinion or a memorandum or some legal analysis that you want to be privileged on a particular transaction. Um, your outside auditing firm uh, that audits your financial statements wants to see a copy of that opinion. If you provide that opinion to that outside accounting firm, which is a third party vis-a-vis -vis the corporation, um, you will have created a subject matter waiver of the attorney-client privilege, okay? If, however, that document uh, is a different document, let's say you're in litigation and you have some attorney work product and your outside accounting firm wants to see a copy of you, that work product, uh, generally, you'll be able to disclose that to your outside accounting firm because they are not an adversary, right? They're not your adversary in the litigation. And, and because the waiver standard is different for work product than for attorney-client privilege, you can do that and not have a subject matter waiver. So you say, well, why don't I just call everything work product? That way I can, I can give it to uh, all sorts of third parties and not worry about this broad subject matter waiver. Um, the reason is because in order to, whoops, in order to um, qualify as work product, um, you, you have to show that the document was um, created in anticipation of litigation. So um, what does that mean? Well, it what that means depends on where you um, reside, where your corporations uh, principal place of business is because the different circuit courts of appeal have different standards about when do you anticipate litigation. In some circuits, they say, look, you have to actually have pending litigation and you have to create this thing be or threatened. You have to actually create this document because of that litigation. In other, circum in other circuits, you can say, well, I you know, here are the facts that that show that I reasonably thought I was gonna be in litigation. You know, the IRS has audited me every year and they've raised these kinds of issues and I had a pending audit and the agent said they were gonna look at this. I reasonably anticipated litigation. So if you're in the right circuit, you can make the, the argument that you anticipated litigation, but it depends on where you are. Um, 
So often it's difficult to prove that at the planning stage of a transaction. It's, it's often very difficult to say with a straight face, I reasonably anticipated litigation. So that's a big limiting factor on the use of work product protection. Um, and a couple, a question from the audience. Yeah, so um, go, going back to um, the, the tax advisor privilege, the 7525 privilege for just a second, um, given the nature of the corporate AMT, uh, and it's based on your financial statement income, and we're talking mostly about you know, publicly traded companies, obviously, um, it seems like it would be fairly common for other governmental bodies to be interested in the same information that the tax authorities are going to be interested in. And so what happens if the SEC obtains privileged information? Now is the privilege broken even vis-a-vis -vis the IRS, or does that still remain privileged information even though other people have it because they're, they're, what, they're seeking it for non-tax purposes? Right. So, so the question is that the corporate AMT is going to be of interest to other federal agencies besides just the IRS. Example, the Securities Exchange Commission. Um, what happens if the SEC obtains from, from your corporation an otherwise attorney-client privileged analysis um, of the CAMT? Does that mean that you've waived the privilege with respect to anybody else? In, in, in fact, maybe you negotiate a deal with the SEC. Hey, I'll give you these documents. We agree as between the SEC and us, we're not waiving the privilege beyond a certain amount. Um, the case law, Jason, is that you've waived it against the rest of the world. That if the IRS were to give you a summons for that um, privileged information, uh, they could argue you've, you've waived it, it with respect to the entire subject matter. So that's that's an issue. Yes. How about if uh, the outside uh, auditors are bound by confidentiality? If the outside auditors do what? Okay, if the outside advisors, uh, let's say accountants or advisors, are bound by a non-disclosure or confidentiality agreement, um, that helps with work product because that helps you prove that you did not disclose the work product to an adversary. It doesn't work with attorney-client privilege, and that's the next. Our next topic is going to be how to remedy that um, the, with a Covell type agreement. And that was actually a very good segue into, into the Covell agreements. Okay, so um, we all know that many of the projects that we work on are incredibly complicated and they take a real team with lots of different um, skill sets uh, and capabilities. They take the you know, sophisticated in-house tax department, they take um, outside accountants, they take outside valuation experts. They take um, outside lawyers. Uh, and, and frequently, you need everybody on a project to really, um, to really uh, do it right. So, how, so are there ways that we can, in that um, context, structure the team and structure everybody's duties in a way that can enhance our ability to protect confidential communications. And the, the, the most common uh, way of doing that is what's called a Covell engagement. And just very simply stated, a Covell arrangement is where you retain a lawyer to give you legal advice. And then to the extent other non-lawyers assist that lawyer in giving you legal advice, um, and you can establish that, then the work of those non-lawyers can also be protected under the attorney-client privilege, the common law attorney-client privilege. So you may have seen this, for example, in a situation where you develop a transfer pricing um, methodology. Maybe your outside transfer pricing legal counsel retains an expert transfer pricing economist to work with your in-house team in developing what methods should we use? Um, what are our risks if we argue this versus that? Um, and, and then that work, if it's done under properly under a Covell arrangement, 
can be subject to the attorney-client privilege, even the work done by the non-lawyer, and even if there's no litigation involved, um, even though the third-party consultant is a, is a third party. All right, so Covell comes from uh, a case by that name where the, the fellow named Covell, this is, you know, 60-year-old case, uh, was a former IRS agent, and he was employed by a law firm, and his, um, the client of the law firm was being alleged for, you know, income tax violations, in fact, criminal violations. Um, and so there was a grand jury subpoena asking for attorney-client privilege information, and they said, well, Covell, you're not a lawyer, so we should be able to get um, uh, your work product. Um, and cutting through everything, the Second Circuit uh, determined that uh, if that non-lawyer was assisting the lawyer in giving legal advice to the client, when, when somebody seeks that non-lawyer's work, they're really seeking legal advice, right? Um, and so that's part of the legal advice, and it should be protected. And um, that case has never been overruled, and people very commonly use Covell arrangements uh, in those types of situations, uh, and, it, and, and in many additional types of situations, um, such as we're going to talk about with the CAMT. The keys to the Cobell arrangement are that somebody has to be giving legal advice to the client. Now, that can be an, an external lawyer. That can be an internal lawyer. Um, the key is whoever is actually giving the legal advice needs to retain the, the Cobell expert, the Cobell non-lawyer expert. And, and here, for example, in the, in the CAMT planning, if you want to... Uh, retain an outside GAP accountant um, under a Covell arrangement, you should really have whoever's advising you on the legal implications of the CAMT retain that person. Um, you can't just, you couldn't have your, you know, employee benefits counsel or your, you know, in-house lit litigation just, just uh, put a transmittal memo on top of whatever the outside accountant does and, and claim privilege. They've got to actually be assisting the lawyer in providing legal advice. Um, so yes, you could have an in-house counsel, if you have an in-house tax counsel, absolutely they could do it, uh, but you're always going to be in a position of wanting to prove that whoever retained the non-lawyer expert um, was actually giving legal advice. Um, and I've seen the government in audits to be a little more skeptical about in-house counsel. Um, I think that's just a situation where, um, you know, people didn't, you know, often in-house counsel wears more than one hat, right? Sometimes you're giving legal advice, sometimes you're giving non-legal advice, business advice, accounting advice, and so just it, to some extent it's a proof issue. Okay, um, you want to have a written agreement, and so you need to clearly define what that agreement is. Now, it's very common for our corporate clients to have relationships with more than one external consulting firm, accounting firm. Um, and in fact, if, if you have an accounting firm that does your, that, that does your auditing, uh, you may even do tax and consulting work with that same firm. Very common to have a master services agreement in place with that firm, right, that deals with terms and conditions and rates and all that sort of thing. Um, my strong recommendation is if you're going to do a Cobell arrangement, don't do it under that master agreement. Have whoever is giving the legal advice have a separate agreement with that accounting firm. You can, you can have a lot of the substantive terms and conditions, but you really, you really want it to be separate because if you ever have to prove it's a Cobell arrangement, you just want to hand over a, let's call it limited scope, agreement saying, we, we have retained you to assist our lawyers in providing advice under the corporate alternative minimum tax, blah, 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 and that's the, the sole um, scope of that agreement. Uh, so what do you do about paying? Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times your, your law firm doesn't want to pay the third party, or you, you've got billing procedures in place or whatever. Um, there's no magic here. I do think that probably the best way to do this is have the um, have the third party expert accountant or consultant 
send invoices to the lawyer who's providing the legal advice, have the lawyer review and approve the bills, forward them to the client, the client can pay them directly. Um, that's probably, in my experience, the best, um, the best way to do it. Okay, um, and you may think, well, gee, this seems like a lot of effort to go to, a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, you read the case law and you see that if you, if you can't prove that the non-lawyer consultant is, is providing, is helping the lawyer to provide legal advice, you end up losing out. And I would encourage you to read this, um, this, ca this Adelman case in the sec Second Circuit um, where the, you know, the old Arthur Anderson was involved, and that's exactly what happened. Um, they, they, they couldn't really show that the engagement with Anderson on the corporate reorganization was really to assist in providing legal advice. It was no different from the rest of the work that Anderson was, was doing under their master agreement with the client. So a few best practices about Covell. Number one, memorialize it in an engagement letter. Um, uh, and, and, you know, start out by saying, you know, you have been, uh, this is a agreement between the law firm or the in-house lawyer and the Covell arrangement. You, you, we, we have um, this issue. I'm providing legal advice on it to my client. I have been authorized by my client to retain an expert accountant to assist me in determining gap, um, gap modeling on, to uh, you know, help interpret the new corporate alternative minimum tax. Um, and you'll work under my supervision and direction, blah, blah, blah. And then it has all the other uh, provisions in it. But have a written engagement letter with the Cobell accountant that, um, that, that says what the scope is. Um, make sure that, and, and sometimes you don't know at the, outside, at the outset how broad is the, the engagement going to be. It may be in phases. It's okay to say, you know, we're going to, um, we'll do it uh, with uh, various scopes of work or in various phases. Phase one, we'll do X. And then if uh, we mutually decide there needs to be another phase, we'll add a supplemental statement of work or whatever. That'll be governed by the same terms of this engagement letter. That's a very, very common um, approach. Um, you've got to deal with who owns the materials that are produced. Who owns the model? You know, if you're doing corporate AMT planning and you're trying to model different answers under different interpretations of the, of the uh, CAMT, who owns that? Uh, I think generally speaking, you want to make sure that the client owns that. Because if you get in an audit and there's a demand by the government for that model, it's the client's privilege to assert, and you want to make sure that everybody understands that it's your document, uh, it's not the third party's document. You know, you don't, if, obviously they're going to use their software and that sort of thing. You don't own their software, but you own the, you own the output. Um, and then a letter ought to deal with, well, what happens if you do get an, an IDR or a summons from the IRS asking for these documents. Um, sometimes that summons goes to the third party. Sometimes the accounting firm or the consulting firm receives a summons. You want to make sure you have procedures in place in the letter saying how that works out. And typically what happens is the, the, the consultant needs to work with you. They need to tell you. You need to assert the defense. Um, often you need to pay their expenses and the like, but you need to work all this stuff out in the, in the Cobell arrangement. Um, and then once the matter's over, you want those files uh, destroyed or returned to you as the client um, because they're, again, they're your, your property. Um, you know, in a perfect world, you actually get this in place before you start work. Uh, sometimes I've seen a situation where, I mean, sometimes it just takes time to get these um, these things in place. Um, I think if there's an understanding at the outset of the arrangement that it's going to be a Cobell arrangement, 
you can have a, uh, an effective date in the, in the letter that is before it's actually signed. Um, but, you know, just look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, let's talk a minute, minute about communication. So, so here's this, just stepping back a minute. What's the scenario we're worried about? The, the best scenario to do these arrangements is when you're going into a project and there's a great deal of uncertainty about what the answer is going to be. Um, that's why you're, you, know, you have questions of how you interpret the rules. And then if you interpret it this way, using your facts or your numbers, how does it apply to you? And gee, could, do we like that answer? And if we don't like that answer, is there another answer? And do we have sufficient authority for the other answer? Um, this is best when, because of the uncertainty, you don't want to create a bunch of work product uh, that reflects bad answers, answers that you don't ultimately rely on, answers that you don't ultimately put on your return. And there's some practical reasons for that, and there's some strategic reasons. Obviously, the practical reason is, you know, every document you have that you have to deal with and produce in an audit litigation costs you money, takes time to track, you know, all that sort of thing. The strategic reason is, well, why do you want to turn over something that you considered and rejected, uh, particularly if there's an email from somebody saying, this is the way this provision applies, and then maybe on further reflection, you, you know, you, you determine that's not the way the position applies. Those kinds of admissions against your interest can, can be really um, unfortunate in an audit or litigation. So, um, so you want, uh, so in addition to putting this arrangement in place, you want to make sure that communications are done um, in, in a way that makes your life easier when and if you have an audit. So some thoughts there. We all communicate electronically, great. Um, Please do not use text. Uh, use email, use work email. Don't use personal email. Uh, you know, chasing former employees and getting their laptops and uh, that sort of thing, if, if there was evidence that they used personal emails on work stuff is, is a nightmare uh, and, and can be very difficult, make your life very difficult going on. Work, e work email, work email accounts. Um, you know, Dropbox type things uh, can, can work as well, too. Um, sometimes when you're working on documents, rather than having a bunch of documents flying back and forth, we found it to be very efficient to just um, share screens, now that we've, we're all using Zoom and, and Teams and the like, and just walk through the document on the screen and talk through and then make one set of consolidated changes rather than have, you know, 20 versions. Um, that can also minimize the number of communications that you have to deal with later on when, when somebody is asking you to provide information. And, and the reason I focus on the practical is if you do assert privilege, what your adversary, it's, say it's the IRS, will ask for is a privilege log, which is literally, you know, a spreadsheet with line items for every single communication you say is privileged. You might have you know, 5,000 line items on that. You know, email from James to Regina, such and such a date, Ray, topic, okay? Um, so the fewer communications you have, the fewer you have to put on the privilege log, uh, and the fewer you have to fight about. Um, so shared screen, I think, is a very, very nice thing. Um, okay. the. One thing that always comes up in the planning process when you have a Covell arrangement and people are worried about it is, well, I, I need my, you know, if you're retaining the GAP account to help do modeling on the CMT, you know, a lot of times the most efficient thing that uh, to happen is for my, my team member who's doing the modeling to deal directly with the people on the GAP accounting team who are doing the modeling do we really have to send everything through the lawyers? I mean, do we have to, you know, doesn't that create unnecessary steps and, and unnecessary um, work? And, and the answer is, um, 
again, you want to prove that the um, uh, that the the gap accountant is assisting the lawyer in providing advice under the CAMT to the client, right? So the lawyer has to be involved in developing the nature and scope of a request. They should be copied. Do they have to be in every single you know call to talk numbers? No, um, but but you if you cut them out completely. Uh, you, you run the risk of, you know, diminishing the, the strength of your of your privilege argument. Um, if there are interviews involved, I think the counsel ought to be involved in those. Um, and then, I think this is a very important one. The the expert, again, if we're in this in the CAMT world, they should they should discuss their views on preliminary recommendations to the client before communicating them to the client, right? Because it needs, again, they're supposed to be assisting counsel in advising the client, and so it really needs to be a collaborative um, uh, collaborative uh, process. Um, and then ultimate recommendations, I think, should be, should come from the, um, from the lawyer incorporating the, the expert. So, you know, you could see the lawyer sending a memo to the client saying, look, we considered X and Y, um, we, we interpret this provision, um, you know, the better reading of this provision is X. Based on that, we had, um, uh, you know, the, the issue, it, it raised an issue of gap accounting and how that applied, so we got our gap accountant involved, and uh, they concluded X, and so uh, applying our interpretation of the statute to their work, here's our recommendation to you. That's basically how, how you would do it, and that, and that should work. Um, so that is, those are the basics of um, using Covell for the CAMT. I can see in terms of some specific issues under the CAMT, I can see a lot of work this year done on am I, am I an applicable corporation? Uh, how, I have been in existence for less than three years, or I acquired entity acts that was formed less than th three years from now, or um, I divested this, or I have this partnership, um, how much of the partnership's income do, do I include, or I have, I mean, there's just a tremendous number of issues to try to sort through uh, in determining uh, am I an eligible corporation, and ultimately you may need you're going to have to take a position on your return that you either are or you are not uh, an applicable corporation. Um, for a close case, you may even have to negotiate with your outside accountant as to whether you have to put up a financial statement reserve for minimum tax. Uh, and I would, I would expect that in that situation, uh, you'd have to deal with the ASC 40, uh, ASC 740. Do I more likely than not? Have I more likely than not concluded that I don't have um, uh, to, to put up a reserve? And and that'll be an interesting that'll be an interesting discussion. And by the time you get to that discussion, the work you're going to share with your outside accountant may be non-privileged, right? Because you're going to want to actually tell them this is the position we're going to be taking, and this is the this is the analysis that we've gone through and the modeling that we've done, and that might be based on work from another accounting firm helping you and your counsel uh, develop that position. And so, particularly early on when you don't know what the answer is, you may want to keep your work product confidential. Um, any, curious if there are any more questions from our live audience here. Um, and let me check, check the, um, I think there have been some, some online questions. Let me just check those real quick. All right. 
There we go. Can you retain, one question is, can you retain a tax accounting advisor to analyze tax law provisions under a COVEL, or would this be problematic given that an outside tax lawyer presumably doesn't need help answering tax law? That's an excellent question. So the answer, the short answer is yes, you can. And it's done all the time. The, I mean, we all know, I wish I had a copy of my paper, Internal Revenue Code. I mean, it's that thick and the regs are that thick and it's, it's incredibly complicated and, and nobody knows everything under the code and so it takes a village, right, um, in, in many cases to, to come up with an answer. So it is um, very common to retain people with specialized tax knowledge, um, including tax accountants at a, an accounting firm um, to assist in, in advising. But um, you can't just say, okay, I, the lawyer, have retained them and I'm just passing their advice on. So you, you have to actually, you, the lawyer who is retaining that specialist, has to actually provide some advice. So for example, if, you know, if James is in-house tax counsel at his company and he retains a, um, somebody who's a specialist in accounting methods or you know, whatever it is, uh, or, or in the CAMT for that matter, um, he's got to take their advice, fold in his own legal advice, um, and apply his legal advice and judgment to then what he recommends to his, to his internal client. And that works. Um, so the devil's kind of in the, uh, the devil's in the details there. Um, another question asked about using in-house counsel for Covell. Yes, just, just to be clear, um, yes. Again, the in-house counsel has to be the person who's providing legal advice. So you can't, again, just slap a transmittal on top of the Covell expert's work and say, here and claim it's privilege. You, you actually have to be giving some legal advice. Now, some larger companies um, have some structural advantages here. They might have, um, uh, they might have tax lawyers in-house who report either directly or a dotted line to the general counsel. And that's kind of a very easy thing to say, hey, I'm wearing my lawyer hat when I'm when I'm giving this advice. In, in, in smaller companies and in other companies, sometimes the in-house counsel wears multiple hats. You know, sometimes they, their duties are, uh, are not all strictly lawyer duties, and so it can be a little bit harder to prove that they're actually giving legal advice. So it's, a, it's really a case-by-case -case sort of determination. But yes, there's no prohibition about using in-house counsel. So George, just to focus on that for a second, the if, if it was an M&A lawyer, you know, if the, if the tax team wanted to use an M&A lawyer to engage the accountants, then that would start to not make as much sense because they're not actually going to be advising on the application of the, the you know, whatever tax rule it is. Right. So, so the question um, from the audience here is, uh, what if you're uh, in a merger and acquisition transaction and, you're out, and your merger and acquisition lawyer wanted to retain the tax accountant, um, would that work? Well, again, if the merger and acquisition lawyer were not actually providing the advice to the client and the outside accountant, tax accountant, was not really assisting that M&A lawyer in advising the client, it'd be risky, right? It, um, it, would be, it would be better if the outside tax counsel on the deal retained the tax accountant. And you know, often the the work distribution. I mean, this, I mean, it could be, you know, twenty percent of the hours can be the the lawyer and eighty percent of the accountant. It's not. It, there's no like magic formula there. Um, but the key is: Are you giving legal advice? And is the um, third party consultant or accountant assisting you in providing that legal advice? Um, another question from Chad. I assume the retained lawyer has an IRS-issued CAF number, which is a centralized file where the IRS tracks, mainly for power of attorney purposes, um, uh, 
people who, who practice before it. Must that lawyer have any other credentials to represent the client to retain attorney-client privilege, attorney work product? So in my view, the lawyer needs to be qualified to practice law. I mean, I think there are, there are situations where people um, uh, have, and this is sometimes the case with inside uh, counsel, hopefully more than outside counsel, they don't bother keeping their bar memberships up uh, because, you know, why bother? Um, I have seen adversaries argue that, well, you really weren't acting in the capacity of a lawyer because you're not even a member of the bar anymore. Um, so you, again, you have to be proving that you're acting in the capacity of a lawyer and, and giving legal advice. Uh, so that's, that's a credential. You know, CAF number is not necessarily, is not dispositive. I mean, something nice to point to, but uh, not dispositive. Um, let's see. Can you point to any case which upholds a Covell where the Covell expert is a tax accounting firm whose mandate was to analyze tax law provisions and provide their tax law advice to the outside lawyer. Yes, um, and there are a bunch of them. Um, maybe, maybe it'd probably be more efficient for you to maybe just contact me after afterward. I'd be happy to go through that. Um, you know, if you do this right, um, again, let's go back to the practical. Uh, it, a lot of times, the most important thing is at what level you get rid of an issue. I mean, it's, you know, you can get rid of it at the Fifth Circuit or the Supreme Court after years of uh, effort and expense, or you can get rid of it when you get the first uh, information document request or draft IDR from the, the IRS agent. Um, I, I personally like to see people get rid of it as early as possible. And so if you, if you structure it right, if you document it right, a lot of times they'll just go away and you'll never have to deal with the more, the more difficult situations. Most, most of the difficult situations, I say many of the difficult situations are when people didn't really uh, take the care to document it. Um, and prepare it right originally. Um, but I think the, back to the corporate AMT, on its face, it seems like it's pure accounting, right? It's just, you know, you've, you've got to pay tax based on what's on your applicable financial statement. A financial statement's pure accounting, right? But, but given all the adjustments that are that are required under the statute, under the Internal Revenue Code, um, from your actual accounting uh, your financial statement, and given all the legal analysis and interpretation that, that may have to go into determining how it applies to you, um, I think it's a classic situation where you want both, right? You want, you want as many smart people uh, looking at it as you can. And if, again, if you're uncertain uh, what the answer is going to be when you embark on the project, there's kind of no downside to, um, to setting up a, a, a Cobell arrangement. Uh, it's, it's like any other large, complicated, uncertain uh, planning project that, that, that you might have in, in the tax world. Uh, okay, I just want to make sure I've gotten all of the, all the questions. Okay, I think that's it. Um, thank you all very much for attending. Um, if you have other questions that we didn't get to or if anything was not clear, I'd be more than happy to talk to you afterward. Um, I think my contact information is on, the, um, is on the webinar information and I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks.